thank you ever so much for having me um, here. As, as David said, I have been involved in the IMA for quite a long time. In fact, it was actually the first uh, maths organisation that I joined when I was a graduate and ended up uh, becoming a chartered mathematician uh, through and a chartered scientist through the IMA. And for about the past six years, I think, I've been involved with the Maths Teacher Training Scholarship Scheme and it is an absolutely fantastic scheme. And I'm very, very proudly wearing my uh, Maths Scholarship badge today uh, for being uh, a helper there. But as uh, they've mentioned, actually, I, I also did a PhD in, in Bayesian statistics. And so just to tell you a little bit about myself in, in case um, you want any more knowledge. Well, here we go. So my name's Sophie and I grew up absolutely loving Lego and aeroplanes. They were the two things I really, really liked. And I used to try and build rockets out of Lego and I, I could never build heat shields. I never had enough heat shields to build um, a rocket ship. And I grew up wanting to play with aeroplanes and went and studied aeronautical engineering. And I absolutely loved it absolutely loved my aeronautical engineering degree and was completely convinced that this was going to be my career path forever and I ended up going to work as one uh, and very quickly became interested in information overload and that led to me doing a part-time PhD in Bayesian belief networks and I got that in 2008 and since then really I've worked in statistical analysis in analytics I think it can be called data science these days, um, but really at heart, I do statistics, but a lot of applied maths as well. It's kind of where they, they both meet. I think the only other things are that I prefer uh, coffee to tea, and I like pears more than apples, and my favorite flower, um, without doubt, is a tulip. Now, a little over 10 years ago, in fact, coming up for 11 years now, I was made redundant, and I founded Bayes Consulting. Um, it is still a micro company, but I have some amazing employees who work with me now. And we work across a range of problems in industry, sometimes with academia, sometimes with um, government departments, and it is on data science problems. And that's where we work. We work really on predictive models, and we also do some, I suppose, what most people would call um, core statistics. But I'm here tonight to talk about how awesome maths is and why maths is really good fun and actually how maths relates to our everyday lives because I think a lot of time there's um, talk about how maths drives every aspect of our lives and it absolutely does it's there in the algorithms in our search algorithms in how we um, get prices for what we're buying but actually what I want to focus on a little bit uh, more today is how maths connects us to the real world and and really actually how it also connects all of us together because i will admit straight up that i am an absolute creature um, of habit and i know or i hope a lot of you would say my morning routine is pretty much set um in stone i'm an early riser i've always been an early riser the alarm regularly goes off at, at five o'clock and that's because i like the quiet of the morning I like to have some quiet time before the hustle and that the bustle of the day begins. Um, it's often just me and my cat sitting downstairs with my uh, book, which at the moment is Beneath the Scarlet Sky by Mark Sullivan. Um, and I've usually got a magazine. I've got uh, the latest maths today. That was my morning reading or significance from the RSS. And then I do a bit of stretching and a bit of thinking. And that quiet time really starts to set me up for the day. But the thing is, there's a, there's a pattern that once I've done that quiet time, the, the house has to get ready. And there is inevitably um, the dishwasher and the washing machine and pack lunches to be doled out and the rest of the house gets up and with shouting and everything that goes on trying to get teenagers out of bed. Um, I make my one and my only cup of coffee of the day. And in the midst of the noise and the questions and, and just the hustle, there is the ritual of the coffee making, and it is genuinely a, a ritual. I have a small cafetiere, and we uh, I have to warm it, and the water can't be 100 degrees when you actually put the coffee in, and you have to put the water in before the coffee, and you've got to heat the mug correctly as well, and once the coffee's in, it's left for four minutes, and then it's a plunge down, or a half plunge up, and you wait another 30 seconds. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm a coffee snob. I'm not. If somebody else wants to make me coffee, that's great absolutely fantastic but um I don't drink caffeine after about eight o'clock in the morning because otherwise I, I genuinely just don't sleep now before you go well what's this got to do with maths and and what has this got to do with linking us to our everyday lives well there are mathematicians who have taken hot drinks uh far more seriously than than I do 
So here we go, how to make the perfect espresso. It turns out, of course, that there are equations relating to coffee, well, for an espresso. Um, so if your preference is actually for a latte or a cappuccino, my apologies, um, we're gonna talk about espressos for a minute. Now, this is a perfect example of applied maths and maths in action, uh, because it actually started with a really fundamental problem of why do two coffees made on the same day in the same way taste different? Because I do have my preferred coffee that I buy and I know how it tastes. And actually, when my husband does make me a coffee, he does make it slightly differently. Um, I like my coffee really strong and his is often not as strong as I would like it. So here is work done by the University of Portsmouth, if you're interested, um, and it's practical applications. They were looking at the modelling and what they understood was the way that the coffee is ground does affect the taste. So the model that they produced initially suggested that you needed um, really fine coffee for a given temperature and pressure in your um, espresso machine. Uh, but what they realised in practice, genuinely in practice, was that when you used uh, very ground, very finely ground coffee, that the, the coffee grinds actually started to clog up. And actually you were getting different tastes because the water wasn't able to actually flow through the coffee. So what you really needed was a slightly coarser ground coffee where you could have very predictable flow that went through and therefore you got a more repeatable taste. So that is actually a win all round. And it was a mathematical problem which ultimately ended up saving uh, the coffee company that they worked with some money and probably made the coffee drinkers happy because they got a more consistent taste which inevitably made the baristas happy. Now, I know we are actually a nation of tea drinkers, and since we all like maths, um, it might not have escaped your notice this year that actually um, one of the world's uh, biggest prizes actually uh, went to somebody who has used stochastic processes to understand the movement of random effects that are actually related to the stirring of a cup of tea. I think it's actually more broader than that, but the way that the news reported it, um, was actually that Martin Hera, who works at Imperial College and won the 2021 Breakthrough Prize, whilst applicable to lots of areas, actually helped us understand how to make or how to stir our tea. So if we're talking about maths and our um, love of, oh, is that moving forward? Let me see. Oh, there we go, here we go. Now, oh, sorry, we're, we're jumping. I'm afraid this is the first, there we go. Now, I'm gonna say that, uh, tea and coffee, hot drinks, it's, it's actually a really unique moment in our day. Um, and the reason I say that is it's an opportunity at the start or any other point where we stop, genuinely stop, because work is quite hectic at the moment and we can pause. And actually you start to focus on the little things. Um, I genuinely think there's something quite magical about watching how milk moves through a cup of tea when you, you pour it in and it you start to see the twists and the turns and eventually you have to stir it with a spoon. I have my coffee black, but my, my husband has milk in it, which is um, why I quite like watching how it, how it moves. Um, now, we're not all like, Martin Harris, so we can't all write down the equations of how it happens, but there is that time where you can just stand and watch the moment and go, oh, look at that. And another great moment I get, and I still get a complete kick out of this, is actually uh, making vortices in cups of coffee. I learned to do this when I was doing my MSc. Uh, in fluid mechanics and if you get a spoon and a still cup of coffee and um, particularly you've got a cup of coffee that's sort of got the white white on the top that's actually just the bubbles from the coffee not actually milk and you you scrape your spoon through um, with the curve of the spoon leading you make some absolute beautiful vortices moving through your coffee cup uh, and I still do it and my kids are now to the point where they know that I will do it and I have had some of the most magical moments of my life sitting with people going, oh, look, have you seen these vortices? And these are vortices that you can see um, elsewhere. Now, it might be that I just love watching milk move through coffee and I like making vortices uh, because I love fluid mechanics. And that was the thing that really kicked off my love of applied um, maths. But 
actually those vortices that you see in cups, they're applicable when you see clouds in the sky and they relate to the design of airplanes and the designs of boats and you can use them with fish. But the thing is, what this all started with is that moment in the day when you think, oh, I'm going to make a cup of tea, I'm going to make a cup of coffee and you start to just pause. And I have, like many other people this year, and that maybe you're the same, I have really missed my coffee chats at work. Yeah, we've got Zoom set up and um, other platforms are available and we are, we're all talking and we're doing our best to stay in touch. But there's something about just those little chats that you have with people, particularly at conferences. So I've had some great virtual conferences this year and it's been fantastic um, to be able to attend a lot more of the conference because I can, I can do it at home and I can fit it around the school and I can fit it around my life. But there's something about those people, those random events that you have when you meet people in waiting for a coffee that just start to spark ideas. Those little um, questions, those little, little fascinations that you sort of have that just sit in your head and either go, oh, maybe I should have tried that approach to answering something or becomes a niggle, a little niggle that you want to try and solve. Um, and those niggles sort of start to turn into questions and those questions sometimes just don't go away until you've really solved them and they might be quite big questions that take a lot of time but the thing that unites us all I think as a community of mathematicians is that we do love puzzles we we absolutely love those questions and when we can't solve a puzzle it's immensely frustrating and if you're going to go and do a PhD you have this puzzle that lasts for years and many of us get a PhD without a definite answer to the question that we set off to and that all comes from stopping just for a moment and just thinking about the little things and and switching switching off just just ever so slightly switching off and thinking about something now we're talking at the moment about how maths links our everyday life and, and links us together and actually we only really got to the first cup of coffee of the day maybe to the second cup of coffee uh, but the thing is, flip back to the start of this year, and often my cup of coffee was on a rather packed uh, commuter train in my travel mug, or it's in the car as I, I used to be driving in my travel mug. Um, now, well, now my commute is a lot shorter. It isn't to the kitchen table and it isn't to the dining room table. Um, I actually have a she shed, which is where I'm talking to you uh, today, which I, I built last year. Um, so it's only a few seconds, probably about 10 seconds. It's longer if I go and look at my veg patch and go for um, a wander around the garden before I start work, which is quite nice. It was lovely today and actually it was frosty and cold um, and I really enjoyed my little walk just from my garden before I started. The thing about commuting is there are some wonderfully, wonderfully wicked maths problems uh, when you start to talk about commuting, about working, how long it is until you get onto the tube. Um, or how long is your commute going to be? What's the most efficient way to get you to work? What's the quickest way to navigate through a crowded train station? Um, and what I find interesting in, in this is that there is an awful lot of maths and the logistical planning of timetables and actually some quite complex decision making on deciding about how you're going to get there. And through all of this, actually what kicks in, really kicks in, is your innate knowledge particularly when your commute has become almost second nature when you've done it for so long that you start to see patterns and you start to see trends and so to give you an example here right at the start of my career quite a few years ago now I commuted every day around the M25 and it got to the point where I knew pretty much within a couple of minutes as to when the variable speed limits would start kicking in and what those speed limits would be, and I would watch them decrease from 70 to 60 and so on, um, as I commuted around uh, about seven junctions of the M25. I also knew, roughly speaking, that about once every three months, it would take me hours to get home because the roads would close or there'd be um, a lane taken out, something like that, quite substantial. And I knew that, so I always had a pack of mints, a bottle of water, and the book I was reading and I still do that I still have not got out of that habit but the question here is my repeated commuting experience gave me I suppose what we would call in maths terms expert knowledge 
Now, the reason I raise this is because it's actually really quite profound. We often debate as a maths community and actually these days more widely, particularly in some media, about the use of expert opinion and, and expert judgment, particularly when we're talking about statistical inference or evidence based decision making. Now, regardless of whether you're an applied mathematician, a frequented statistician or even a Bayesian statistician, actually using subjective judgment, expert opinion, we just create quite a debate. I always love the fact that when you talk to non-mathematicians, they'll say, oh, you know, is it a really exciting field? Do people actually have debates? Oh, yes. Yes, we do. And I absolutely love the vibrancy of the maths community. And I really love some of the debates we have, particularly about expert judgments. And I think that's what brings us together and, and really links with the real world. Now, in case you're not aware, when we start talking about Bayesian statistics and certainly frequentist statistics, to me, this is like talking about rugby, okay? There is rugby league and there is rugby union. Both of them have absolutely ardent supporters and both will tell you that their version of rugby is undoubtedly the best. Now, I grew up in Barnsley, or well, a village just outside Barnsley, uh, so I supported Barnsley Football Club. I still do. It's still the best football club in the world. Um, and we all supported as a family the Leeds Rhino. So I grew up watching rugby league, and this was the, the code I understood and I knew. And then I went to university. But I went to university in Bath, and Bath didn't play rugby league. They played rugby union. And to this day, I never know if my dad was more surprised that in my first term at university, I managed to make the first rugby team all that I was playing rugby union. I'm never sure what he was more surprised um, about. But regardless of whether you're talking um, about frequentist statistics or Bayesian statistics, we still use expert judgment. And in Bayesian statistics, one of the things often comes back to Bayesian statistics, which I love because to me, it's intuitive. I think Bayesian statistics to me just represents how we think naturally. I just get my head about how it sort of works more naturally to me than I ever did about frequented statistics, which is what, like many people, I was introduced to at the start. So when we do Bayesian statistics, a lot of the time, or quite a lot of the time, we might use expert judgment to come up with some subjective priors. And that's often when the frequented statisticians um, think that the data should be used, and only the data, and the data should speak for itself. But that covers up some of the subjective um, experts and the subjective knowledge that we inevitably used in frequentist statistics about choosing what test statistic to use because you're drawing on what you you know. I think the use of expert judgment is a lot to me like uncertainty. It is there in all the maths that we do. It links us to what we're doing in the real world, particularly when we're talking about applied maths. So instead of maybe having these heated debates about who's using it correctly, perhaps we should start to move those debates on a little bit more and start to talk about, well, how often are we actually using our subjective knowledge? How often are we using something that to us now has just become second nature? But for those people who are starting out, it might not be. And when we're starting to work on some of these really big and really complicated problems, maybe it's time to be upfront about just how much that expert judgment could potentially be leading to um, unproducible results or misleading results or inadvertently entering in bias. Because I think deep down we're all doing it and we're all working in maths for society. So why don't we start to have those conversations a little bit more? The three things I've mentioned so far that link maths to our everyday lives, I think can be um, summarized in a few key points. There is Oh, is that working? There we go, sorry. There's um, slowing down. Really just slowing down and taking the time to talk because maths is rarely a solo endeavour and actually linking things to our lives and sparking ideas off takes time to look at those little things. It takes time to look at how the milk moves in the coffee. It takes time to chat to people and see what they're working on and see if you can help them or they can help you. Um, it's also about finding a puzzle just finding something that sparks that information in your head that goes oh we need to look at this further how are we going to make it um and then well spotting a pattern because 
patterns are such an inevitable part of what we do and how we solve our puzzles that these are just part of everyday life and moving outside of work and finding that question you want to answer was something I was inspired by when I was reading a book by the psychologist um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. I think that's how he pronounces his name. I've done my best. Um, and if you're not really, it's called Flo. He's a psychologist. And I really heartily recommend it because it covers some of the topics that we, we sort of almost take for granted when you realise how much you love maths. It takes work that's enjoyable. It is. Maths is enjoyable and, and it's rewarding. And I think when we start to talk about how maths connects us really to our everyday lives, it actually, doing maths is when time sort of gets suspended. You just get completely immersed in what you're doing and how you're solving that puzzle. And you bring all your skills and your, your knowledge to bear. Now, I will admit that I am incredibly lucky because I, I love my job. I mean, like, I really love my job. And I have in the past been accused of being a workaholic. And I, um, I'm going to refute that because I do turn the computer off and I put the phone away and I walk away and I, I don't do work. But the thing is, I do love learning about maths and I love working in maths. Um, it isn't effortless, which, by the way, is another definition of flow. Uh, it's certainly not effortless all of the time. But I do get a huge joy out of focusing on one thing, of turning off all the distractions and, and just putting the skills I have to bear on solving problems. Now, most of the time, I don't get the answer straight away. In fact, very rarely do I get the answer straight away. And that is, um, that's OK. That's OK, because it's just an opportunity to learn. It's just an opportunity to find a new math skill that I don't possess yet and, and carry on. And to me, that's how maths starts to mirror our everyday life because there's no manual for life apparently um, we end up finding our path and making our own way and I think one of the things that we often um maybe oh is that moving oh there we go okay oh no it's jumped again I'm really sorry uh one of the things about doing our work and one of the things about um, looking at how this links to our everyday lives is that we're really quite good at spotting a pattern and it's sort of just sometimes within us and it might be that we set these everyday patterns in our lives from getting up and getting out of the house or how we choose to start our working day when we switch our computers on um, and the truth is at the moment that it's actually never really been easier to in many ways get an answer out there are so so many tools that we have to our availability to put data sources in and you, you click a button and out pops a result and before you go not where i work honestly you should see the data you should see what i've got to work with da, 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 da. um i'm just going to remember that there was a time when i was a little bit younger at university when you would have to get it before dawn to go and get your time on the uh, the magic cray computers you would diligently wait your turn and now now there are there is just such an explosion of software that that we could use the automation that we, we're, we're working with can almost distract us from how we actually link to that data in our everyday lives and how we should be connecting actually with what that data and what our maths is is doing when we're doing our analysis when we're working in maths it's really important that we keep asking the questions of why are we doing this? And when we've got those results, understanding that the approach we've taken, which inevitably will have used some of our subjective judgments and inevitably have taken our knowledge, can we interpret what we're seeing and can we see ourselves in those answers? Can we see what we were expecting? And if we can't, why not? I think maths is awesome at making us think about some of the, the questions that we, we really need to talk about, some of those fundamental level questions maths as we we know as a maths community is not about our ability to just churn out page after page after page of e equations it is this incredibly vibrant and alive subject that we want our answers to genuinely stand the test of time it wants to be something that comes with us on our on our life and if we're going to do that 
we need to start talking about how uh, the, the methods that we're using are trustworthy, about how we collect the data, about the ethics, about the potential biases, about populations and sample sizes. But they're all things that when you start to talk about how does that connect me to my everyday life, people might not understand. But actually, when you talk to people, if we do the hard work right, and it is just one of those joyous things to actually sit and do what others may feel is slightly tedious, slightly repetitive, boring work, but actually just let you sit and focus and brings immense joy into your life. We can then go and talk to others who might not see how maths connects with their life and help them start a conversation about maths. Help them to understand that maths is not just some abstract thing which is driving the search engine in their mobile phones, but actually is connecting them with other people around them. And the reason I say that is for the simple reality that maths connects us all because maths moves us. We are human and we are emotive and we have those reactions to things. And the power of a single number often gets underestimated. So three and a half billion people roughly use social media every day for about three hours. That's a lot of hours on social media every day. It might be more than 60% of all startups fail. Certainly when I set up my little company, that was something that stuck with me a long time. 20% of all FTSE board women are, uh, board members are women. These are the types of numbers that actually get people talking. These are the types of numbers that people go, hmm. So if we're talking about connecting through our day and our work about how maths links everybody together, actually getting people to start those conversations comes from numbers it's those types of conversations that get communities to start to change now i see maths uh, connectors in different ways there's something really beautiful about a good proof um the simplicity of two curves joining together when you spend an awful lot of time trying to make those curves join up um it's lovely and it's things like that that you go just look at that it's just there and it's gorgeous and it is as beautiful as any painting um, as beautiful as, as any piece of poetry. And I think if we remember that we're human and that maths is just that integral part of us, then we can start to connect um, communities together. I think the other thing we ought to really, really pay attention to um, is the fact that maths helps us solve some of the trickiest problems, trickiest problems that we are we are facing. And Solving those problems is going to need multidisciplinary teams. Maths is a fundamental life skill. And if you're wondering what the quote is um, on, the, on the screen, it's actually from the current government's manifesto for the last election. Um, creative skills aren't just in the arts. Creative skills are this part of maths. It's, it's not just numeracy. Maths is so much more. Oh, sorry. It's tricksy today isn't it when we're talking about how we as a community work with maths and how maths links to our everyday lives i think we have to get better at expressing the creativity and the skills we have as mathematicians that aren't just about writing out an equation about those skills that we develop to answer some of the questions when we start to think um, outside of the box but also we're all connected by the fact that we have to use and interpret numbers and statistics so when you see the world around us if we've got the skills to understand what the statistic means if we've got the skills to make those decisions and inform decisions that's great but many around us don't we have to be able we have to get better at helping people understand uncertainty and um, it's important it's there in absolutely everything we do there is a story that we start to see behind everything in the media, in our social media. There is a puzzle and there was a data set that created somebody to do work that put out a number. So how do we help people start to have those conversations? I think what it really um, boils down to is our understanding as consumers of numbers and the way in which we use numbers and those of us who are lucky to, to work with numbers get to care about it most is actually how can we talk about the methods that we use how can we talk about the uncertainty 
um, that's in there? And then how can we use our language? Because what links us, what links us to society, what links maths into our everyday life is our ability to communicate these things. So if we really want to be able to talk about some of this, it is absolutely critical, absolutely critical um, that we get this correct. Now today, the RSS, I think it was today, it might be the, the Royal Statistical Society actually released their um, uh, examples of uh, statistics and journalism and, and the winners about that. And they are absolutely fantastic examples of how maths in everyday communities are used. Now, when we're talking um, about how maths is actually used to um, help those problems, one of the things I think I really want to talk to you about is a few of the projects that we're involved in uh, at the minute, which is linking the maths we do in three different areas that shows people how maths can make a difference. Um, since June of this year, Bayes has been working with a couple of companies, um, IBDM and VR Simulation Systems, to help independent food banks forecast and plan to meet for the demand of their absolutely invaluable community services. Um, food banks do an immense amount of work and they do a great deal more than acting um, solely as providers of emergency food rations. They are a conduit often for local uh, community services. They can offer advice on a range of other areas and more than anything else, they are uh, the human face and offer a cup of tea and a listening ear for people who just need help. So what we've been doing is using a range of data science and forecasting techniques to understand how the changes in the local community might mean that there is a change for the need in the services of the food bank. Uh, what we're doing is providing the food banks with a series of predictions for them to help them plan and understand about what is likely to be happening. And it will help them focus more on actually understanding about what type of food they're going to need, how much they're going to need, and then who is likely to come and need their help. We were really lucky to get to be able to do this project thanks to an Innovate UK grant and it has been incredibly rewarding. It's been really challenging. Um, I certainly wouldn't say it's one of the, the easiest projects we've ever taken on. But actually, when you start to talk about how maths links us to a community and to every day, it has been really fantastic. And we've thoroughly enjoyed it. And we're incredibly thankful to all the food banks who uh, worked with us. The project is running definitely till the end of November um, and hopefully further onwards after that. The other project that we've been involved in that really does start to link us um, through to our local communities is actually trying to understand where shellfish come from. Now, the UK is an island nation, um, and so we have quite a large coastal zone. And actually, the coastal waters of the UK uh, support an incredibly diverse range of fish species, many of which um, we sell in commercial and recreational fisheries. The actually fish industry, the shellfish industry, exceeds about £250 million pounds, uh, a year, and it's a really key entry point for fishermen. Um, to be able to actually, for new fishermen to actually be able to uh, enter the industry. One of the things that we've been actually looking at is how to work out where shellfish come from, because they grow um, within 12 miles of the UK shoreline, they're fairly sedentary, and actually shellfish act almost as a sedentary sessile in that you can look and understand the composition of a shellfish and be able to say where it comes from. And the reason, the actual fundamental reason that's important is because across the world, illegal, uh, unreported and unregulated fishing uh, harms the oceans, it depletes stocks uh, and can adversely affect local fishing communities. But actually, evidence-based decision-making to, to stop those practices it is quite hard to come by. Uh, and what we've been looking at is how we can use the microchemistry along with a company called Key Marine to determine if shellfish have a unique site-specific uh, chemical signature, which we can then use to understand where they, where they come from. Uh, we did a small field trial, with, or Key Marine did a small field trial, we've been working on to analyse the results. And what we've been finding is using quite small sample sizes, this is not big data, this is not, um, by any stretch of the imagination, it's quite small data actually, to understand how we can take these signatures and look over wider geographic areas and then look at linking chemical fingerprints to help people understand where illegal and regulated and unreported um, fishing might be actually uh, occurring. 
and that's been a great project that's been going on for a few years now. The other area that we've um, been working in is with uh, the Greater Manchester Combined Authorities, which has a plan to be carbon neutral by 2038. And they have a real need and an understanding um, to domestically retrofit their housing stock. Um, and what was needed for that was a baseline and energy modelling. So we're working with two companies. We're making the Powerty project, um, AV Research and the Energy Systems Catapult, to actually understand and predict what are the hazards that are likely to be being seen in a home. So what we're doing is looking at a statistical model and it predicts the home health and safety rating system, HHSRS, uh, which has hazards such as cold or damp mould and excess heating that type of um, information and we're bringing together lots of different data sources and we are starting to work together uh, to produce a predictive model to understand uh, what hazards might be present within a home. Now we might say that the three problems I'm talking about here actually maybe might not be the most important issues that society face but what I want to give you is a breadth of an understanding of where maths actually really comes into play because I think one of the great things about maths that's often overlooked is that it actually helps us ask the really really big why and how questions and at a superficial level it's sometimes easy to say well, you just do this, or you just apply that approach, or you just add those two numbers together. But a mathematician's ability to think differently and to think almost abstractly and to pause in the day is actually when we start to really, really ask those big how and why questions. And I think we're very, very good at asking those. And I think we're very good at coming together as a community to start to solve the really big how and why questions, because I think mathematicians are open to debate and they're open to different ideas. And I think we are incredibly good at working together to solve these really big problems. And when we start talking, um, about how we're gonna come full circle, about how maths connects us with the real world. The simplistic answer is that maths is hidden everywhere. It's in the technology, it's in the algorithms, it's in the adverts we see and, and all of those things I mentioned earlier. But maths, I think deep down requires us to dream. I really do think that um, from those tiny, tiny ideas that develop into those niggles, to the questions, to the to the puzzles. Um, the multiplicity, the multidiscipline teams that I have the absolute delight of working with give me some of the best chats and some of the most amazing friendships, some of the most amazing friendships that I've I've developed. Um, and they've come from those cups of coffee uh, as we all work towards a single aim. Being part of the maths community is without doubt the most amazing thing and I am forever thankful for the amazing support I, I get from everybody and I always try to repay everybody who helps me and I am um, I will happily talk about maths till I'm blue in the face. I think some of the biggest how and why questions that we look at in maths are sometimes disparaged because they might not immediately have a really clear um, application but it's often that research which takes the road less traveled um, it's often those research ideas that maybe hundreds of years later turn out to help us solve the problems that we're facing now it takes people to go and to do the deep work and the slow work and to think and acknowledge that thinking time is not wasted that thinking time is really really good and sometimes solutions just can't be rushed that we have to go and allow ourselves to do that because 
working and living just in a community. I live in a wonderful little village. Um, maths, statistics can help to make people's lives better in really quite measurable ways. And I think the last thing that maths does to link us to our, our everyday lives um, is that it's through a bit of love. It's the love of what we do. Because in all honesty, I genuinely hand on heart cannot think of a better way to spend my life than doing what I do. I really do love my job and I absolutely love working in maths. So I hope that if we all allow ourselves to have a bit of abstract time and to think of those ideas and to just jot down those ones that we think about. And then we maybe try and apply what we think of and the solutions that we come up with. And if we all just support each other as a community a little bit more and spread the love of maths and help each other, um, I think from sunrise to sunset, day after day after day, uh, we will actually genuinely um, start to see how maths helps society. Thank you. Okay, th thank you very much, Sophie. That was, um, yes, that was, uh, that was fascinating. And uh, I think a different, different perspective from what we often, often have in these talks, which is the sort of, the really sort of aesthetic and emotional side of the subject. Um, so I think I think that was that was really, really good to see. Um, so if you've got questions, please please type them in the chat box. I think I um, might sort of chair, chair's privilege start off um, with a couple of questions myself. Um, so um, you so you mentioned you started your career out in in um, engineering and and then then moved into Bayesian statistics and maths. So this sort of affection that you have for the subject, is that something that you've always had or is it something that has developed over time through particularly seeing the, the real world applications? So I think it became clear to me, so I, I, I still have a ridiculous love of airplanes. That's never gone, ever gone. Um, what became apparent when I started university pretty much in the first two days was that I was going to pass